Hello and welcome to this live programme from Bailey Gifford, the latest in a series of webinars where we talk to the managers of the business's different investment trusts. Today we're talking to Roderick Snell and he is manager of the Bailey Gifford Pacific Horizon Investment Trust, a closed-end fund which invests across all of Asia, ex-Japan. My name is Richard Lander of Citywa and I'll be talking to Roderick about how he runs the trust for around 25 minutes. We'll then be taking your questions which you can submit at any time via the Q&A box in Zoom. So thank you for joining. And uh, Roderick, nice to see you again. Uh, so we meet again after a torrid year for growth investors and probably doubly so in the markets that you operate in. Uh, what's the outlook now for Asia and those markets? Sure, well, look, it's definitely been a, a difficult year for, for growth and for Asia, uh, and it might well stay volatile for, for a while. Uh, however, I'm actually really quite positive on the outlook uh, for Asia. Um, sentiments near the levels we last saw on the global financial crisis. Um, valuations are attractive. I look at companies like Hynix, sort of global cyclical bellwether, you know, less than one times book. Again, valuations we last saw during the global financial crisis. Then there's the macro, and Asia is actually looking really very well placed. I think the key observation here is we've had a period of US of the US dollar surging, which historically would have led to an emerging markets crisis. But that hasn't happened this time. You know, Asia and EM are actually doing okay. Um, EM has started to emerge. Um, now, why is that? Well, it's really because Asia is a much better place than it has been um, uh, previously and really compared to other regions. Um, you know, firstly, most of the problems today are actually in the West. You know, Asia doesn't have rampant inflation. Secondly, the region has behaved much more prudently Asia didn't print money and destroy its balance sheet stimulating during COVID. Um, you know, China, physical and monetary stimulus in COVID would have been about 10% of GDP. Europe would be near 70%, so seven times. Thirdly, many Asian countries have been running with real interest rates for many years versus negative in the West. And finally, capital inflows to EM have been negative for the best part of the best part of the decade. So you haven't got all that hot money um, looking to come out, um, come out rapidly. So, yeah. Asia and the emerging markets more broadly are in better shape than much of the West, and you might just grow up in the now and really the converging markets. Uh, you throw into that that long term, Asia has by far better growth. So you've got better growth, better financial positions, and it's at a discount. Um, so volatile period, but I think Asia looks pretty decent on the three to five year time horizon from here. All right, you sound confident. Uh, just looking back over the year, uh, what are the type of companies that were most badly hit? And what was the type that helped your performance? Sure. Well, as a reminder, you know, our portfolio does look very different to most other Bailey Gifford funds uh, and indeed many other growth managers. Uh, for example, our, our large low rate positions uh, would be uh, materials and energy. Uh, and that's because we embrace growth in all of its forms. So our portfolio looks a little bit like a, a, little bit like a barbell uh, at the moment. Uh, at one end, we've got sort of traditional rapid technology stocks. Um, but at the other end, we've got large, large amounts of cyclical growth. Like commodities, uh, which are really copper and nickel, to focus on the on the green transition uh, and industrials. Now, the past couple of years, that balance has been really very beneficial, uh, especially when we've seen some of the growthier sort of tech names, for example, come under quite quite a bit of pressure. Um, you know, that's been offset by these more cyclical names like uh, Tata Motors, the Indian automotive company, or or Medeca Gold and Copper uh, in Indonesia, uh, which have performed very well over the past year. The last six months have certainly been a bit more challenging. Uh, we've seen those rapid growth names um, struggle a lot, um, especially in places like e-commerce. Uh, you know, many, um, many Asian e-commerce companies down about 60 or 70 percent, uh, and really no discrimination between the quality of those companies. So starting to see some opportunities there. And at the same time, that cyclical growth bucket, which had previously offset some of that weakness, although it's done OK, it's also come under pressure uh, as we've had fears of a global slowdown. Uh, which have been increasing. So that portion of the portfolio hasn't offset the headwinds that we've seen in those more traditional growth parts of the portfolio. Okay, so coming through this turbulent time for every investor everywhere pretty much, do you think the Asian story of fast-growing economies, smart, innovative companies, is that still intact, do you think? Yeah, I think very much so. Um, you know, you know, the big picture is that you know over the next decade, driven by the rise of the Asian consumer. Asia is going to be the fastest growing region globally, um, combined with the fact that it's a better place financially um, than really ever before, uh, as, as mentioned. 
And then if you look at the companies, you can see this really all in action. Um, I was actually out in Korea about three weeks ago. It's my first first investment trip um, since COVID. And the innovation is just, it's just amazing, to be honest. Um, I met with Bong Kim, for example. He's the founder of Coupang, a uh, company that we're in, which is the largest e-commerce company in Korea. And they're just light years ahead of Western peers. Um, the key to their success is that anything you order in Korea, from groceries to electronics, before midnight is delivered by 7 a.m. that morning. Uh, and to do that, they just have the most advanced logistics centers you'll find anywhere in the world. Um, I went to one which covers about 10 football pitches and is 21 stories high. Um, and it's very funny, they, they've employed a large number of people from Amazon, from the US, to help with the logistics. Uh, and one of them joked to me that he didn't actually, he didn't actually know why they needed him because Coupon were already so far ahead of Amazon. So um, yes, yeah, certainly, certainly see the, see the innovation and the, and the speed of growth very much on track in the, uh, across the region. All right. Uh, there is still a certain amount of scepticism uh, in investors around the world that Asia can, can carry it off. It still has this story. Uh, what do you think explains that? Is it just people don't look at it closely enough? I think there's a couple of reasons. You know, firstly, until recently, if I say sort of 15 years, many investors haven't necessarily had to think about Asia. You know, the easiest way to make money in innovation was simply to invest it in the largest market in the world, you know, the USA. Uh, and the Nasdaq, which has had, a, had an extraordinary run, um, you know, things might be starting to change. Secondly, and I, I think the real opportunity for us is that Asia is just not that well covered. Uh, you know, it's harder to know what is happening, uh, and that makes it inefficient, uh, and therefore really a great place for us to find companies. Um, you know, a couple of examples, uh, again, back in Korea, um, met a company called uh, EO Technics. It's another company that we own. This is a yeah, fantastic business. It's got a 100% market share in lasers for making semiconductor wafers. So every semiconductor in the, in the, in the world will have to use an EO Technics uh, machine. More importantly, it dominates laser technology that we use to drill and cut wafers. Currently, that's actually done with a, with a mechanical saw. So there's really a, a revolution in the industry as we go from saws to lasers, and they are at the very forefront of that business. They were very close ties with uh, Samsung Electronics. So huge potential, but it's not covered by any analysts, uh, and the CEO and the chairman, they actually don't, they don't meet investors. Um, I was the first one they had met for about two years, uh, and that was purely because we owned uh, nearly 10% of the company. So lots of hidden gems in individual companies. Um, and then more broadly, you know, I think another good example would be you know, the Chinese A-share market. You know, hugely inefficient, probably the most inefficient market in the world. Um, it's huge, you know, 3,000 companies over a billion, but most of it is retail, and the average holding period is about 50 days. So the time frame of resources, if you've got them, you can add a lot of value. Um, so that's, that's why I think people, or the opportunities uh, for, for, for the long-term stock pickers comes across, across Asia. Let's look at China, your biggest allocation by country. Uh, been a pretty strange year there. Continued lockdowns, increasing uh, interest in, in, should we put it like that, by the government in what companies do. And then on top of that, you've had a, a pretty nasty property bubble. Uh, and that leads some investors to think the country as a whole is uninvestable. You obviously don't. So how would you counter that argument? Sure. Well, yeah, absolutely. Investors have had a, a torrid time in the country. Uh, you know, you've had a huge regulatory storm, uh, worsening geopolitics, slowing economy, continued lockdowns. Um, so why is it uninvestable? Look, firstly, just... The opportunity is huge in China, so it deserves to be on everyone's radar. You know, the middle class is the largest in the world, the economy and stock market, the world's second largest, and it's still hugely under owned. You know, look at the numbers, I think it's about 17, 70% of global market cap, a third of listed companies are in China, but it's just 2.5% of global fund allocations. So let's look at the issues, um, of which there are many. Um, I think the key one for the past couple of years has been really regulations, uh, which is wrapped up in this term common prosperity, you know, the desire for a, a more equal society. And here I think the key question is, is this regulatory crampdown Xi's attempt to roll back the market reforms of the past few decades and take down the private sector? That's the key question. Uh, and I think the answer is actually quite clearly no. Um, why? Well, because the economy is absolutely crucial to the party. You know, it's what gives it its legitimacy. Um, and that's really the difference between China and, say, the former USSR. China understands the economy matters, and it's the, the market-based reforms and growth 
that he kept the party along with the Soviet power. Um, just to understand that, just don't forget how successful China's been. You know, back in the 1980s, GDP per capita was less than Afghanistan. So for the past 40 years, people have only seen rapid improvement in the living standards. Uh, young people have only known a very prosperous and increasingly powerful China. Um, so at its core, China is not going to destroy the private sector, uh, which accounts for 90% of new job creation, um, because that would be a, an existential threat to, to Xi and the, uh, and the CCP itself. Okay. Uh, in fact, you spent most of this year investing more in China, and you ended up with a larger allocation than a year ago. Why, uh, what drove you to do that? I mean, it's one thing not to disinvest, it's another to actually go in there and raise your allocation. Sure, and I suppose we're still underweight China at the moment, but as you rightly say, I have been adding. Uh, from a bit of perspective, we have been very underweight China about 12, uh, 12 months ago. But we've been underweight for a couple of years, especially in the, uh, the large technology platforms like Alibaba uh, and Tencent, uh, really on fears of competition and or regulation. Um, so while we started to add, well, first of all, I just said that broad point that actually we don't think, we don't think China is trying to destroy its private sector. Secondly, there's a lot of valuation support at the moment. Um, yeah, the MSCI China is down about 50%. Um, uh, Chinese listed companies in the US are down about 70%. Um, uh, stock level, you know, if you take Alibaba, which is a stock we have been very cautious on, but have been adding to now. You know, the core e-commerce business there is trading on about four times P multiple for a business that made about $30 billion last year. So a lot of valuation support. Um, the other one I was looking at it was if you take the Hang Seng ticket tech index as a, as a proxy for, uh, for the Chinese internet sector, um, then essentially the entire Chinese sector, you know, Alibaba, JD.com, uh, Meituan, that whole sector is worth less than Amazon at the moment, which just feels, just feels wrong. On to the regulation, um, which has been the big problem. It's been implemented badly, but actually when you take a step back, it's broadly pretty sensible. Um, you know, it's essentially about anti-monopoly practices. Um, and that's actually good for the whole ecosystem, you know, stopping Alibaba from uh, preventing clients from listing on other websites. You know, that's not a good thing. You know, opening that up is good for the overall tech ecosystem. And I'd argue that China is probably actually leading the world in terms of uh, regulating its tech sector. So that's part of the reason why, we, why we've been adding. Uh, and also just from a macro position, actually China. China is really pretty well placed. I say it hasn't had a mad stimulus, it's got real, real relative interest rates, um, and possibly you know, one of the few countries in the world uh, actually cutting rates over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, so um, uh, in a very difficult cycle to really the rest of the world. Within your China allocation, has the balance of the portfolio shifted? Um, yes, a little bit. So uh, I suppose sort of the main things that we have been adding back into technology after being significantly underweight um, so two to three years ago. Um, so adding to some of our existing names like JD.com, uh, which have been our, one of our bigger overweights, uh, and getting back into some, some stocks that we've just um, we've been very cautious on for, for quite some time, like, like Alibaba. Um, also took some new holdings, uh, bought Baidu, um, the, the sort of Google of China, uh, again looking very cheap, about seven times P multiples for that core search business. Um, but what's exciting there is they've been investing for the past five or six years to become a leading um, player in autonomous driving uh, in terms of the AI in that space. And there's indications that we can see from China that they are possibly the anointed winner uh, in that space. Uh, they've just been allowed to be the only company in China uh, to do high precision mapping, uh, which is a very sensitive topic in the country. So I think Baidu is looking at very interesting. The other area we've been adding to would be what I call perhaps policy aligned companies. Um, uh, those that are sort of in tune with the next ten-year plans of the of the uh, of the uh, of, of the government, um, and that's across a, a range of areas: semi semiconductors, industrial, and environmental um, would be the most obvious of those. Uh, and we've been adding particularly the environmental areas to so companies like Longyi, which is uh, uh, the world's largest um, uh, solar panel maker, uh, and Wuxi uh, Lead, uh, which is involved in EV batteries. Um, so that's really what we've been uh, where we've been adding to uh, in China. Uh, over the past six to 12 months. Okay, and let's contrast that with uh, your investments in India. You've pared those back a little. Uh, why did you do that? Sure, it's still a, a, a big position for us and very much like the, the long-term story of India. Um, firstly, 
just actually to fund new ideas, um, especially that we were finding in China uh, and also Indonesia. Those have been the two places we've been adding to most recently. Um, on top of that, valuations had done very well. Uh, you know, India had, had been one of the best performing markets in the past 12 to 18 months. Um, and then there were some macro concerns. You know, typically, in India is the, uh, the most exposed of the large Asian economies to rising energy prices. Um, um, has a lot of oil imports, um, and that used to blow out the, the twin deficits, they used to call them, the current account uh, and the physical account due to, due to subsidies. Um, but they've actually done, to be fair, much better than I, than I would have expected, um, in part, part because they've been able to buy Russian energy, uh, about 20-30% of oil coming from Russia, at a pretty steep discount um, to global prices. Okay, so you're still keen on India as a long-term story, uh, the new China, some people would say. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I suppose that's the that's the big question. Can it can it be the new China? And it's certainly got a huge opportunity to do something exciting. You've got, it's got the demographics, the institutions. The biggest challenge to it replicating something like China um, is export manufacturing. You know, that is what you need to emerge, um, and that's where India has been not quite so good. You know, it hasn't built up that export manufacturing base that that it should be able to leverage leverage off its um its cheap um, young workforce. Um, signs that it might be changing. You know, Labour and landlords have been big issues that have held back multinationals, but it's interesting that you know, Apple only today uh, went and put in to start production of, of some of its um, some of its um, some of its uh, phones in the country as it looks to move out of China. Um, so potentially some interest there. And the other area I think really is interesting is what I'd call New India. Um, so if you look at India traditionally, where we've got you know a decent chunk of our portfolio. It's got great businesses with very high returns, but those returns are really because of the, the problems of India. Um, bureaucracy, corruption, lack of infrastructure. You don't get multinationals coming in. You don't get local players coming up. Um, you just have nice, cozy monopolies with very high returns. What's exciting is what might be happening over the next five or 10 years, which I call the new India, because um, India's lacked innovation. But with the advent of 4G that was put in by Reliant Industries about uh, four years ago, the uh, largest 4G network in, in the world, and that's brought the internet to the masses. And we're now seeing a raft of actually very exciting um, internet and technology businesses and genuine innovation coming through the country. Um, and I think that, that could be well, a, a fantastic opportunity for investing. Um, we could actually be a real spurt to growth over the next five to 10 years and, and maybe make India reach, reach its potential. Okay. Leaving aside these two giant countries, uh, which other locations do you, do you think are emerging as the most innovative uh, centres for and growth centres in across Asia? You mentioned Indonesia yeah, just yeah. A, a second ago. Indonesia is interesting, um, but I think if you, had, if you had to pick, if you had to pick one country across across Asia that's got the best structural growth story, um, it would still very much be Vietnam. Um, you know, it's the one country of any size that's actually building up an export manufacturing base um, in the region or actually across any, any emerging market. Uh, and that's absolutely crucial. You know, I can't stress enough times that you know, most emerging countries sadly never emerge. The only ones that do, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, China, they have a successful export manufacturing base. Um, and China, sorry, Vietnam is the one that is building it up. Uh, and the long term story here is low end manufacturing coming out of China, probably two and a half, three trillion dollars worth. Um, that's increasing with geopolitical tensions and increasing lockdowns. The lion's share of that is going and will continue to go to Vietnam. So I think Vietnam has the best structural underpinning for any of the economies um, across Asia, uh, and hence it's one of our, one of our largest positions, uh, overweight positions um, within the trust. Yeah, interesting. You've preempted a couple of the questions from viewers there saying, uh, I noticed in your latest report, you got about 6% in Vietnam. And one of the questions was, uh, why, you know, why do you have more there than 6%? Is it opportunities that uh, are just not available yet? Or are you going to increase it? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to have more. Um, it comes down to the opportunity set. Um, uh, it is, it's been improving. Um, but there are, there are some problems investing in Vietnam. Um, uh, the first used to be liquidity, but actually that's much improved. It's, about, it's, about, it's as liquid as the likes of Indonesia and Thailand. Um, but there are foreign ownership limits in a number of the best companies, um, which means that they trade on premium and it's actually quite difficult to get access to those businesses. 
Um, those foreign premiums uh, have been coming down uh, and there are rules um, being put in place to, to actually make them, to actually remove those limits. Um, but that is going to take you know, several years. Um, but as that happens, the opportunity set in Vietnam um, will, will improve. Um, and it's really worth noting as well that actually, although I talk about the export and a factory story being the, being the, real, the real gem of, of, in, of Vietnam, you can't actually buy that directly. There aren't many listed um, Vietnamese companies. You know, most of them are multinationals. Uh, Samsung Electronics is the largest uh, investor in Vietnam, about $18 billion over the past, over the past decade. Um, so what we're really playing is the domestic story that's able to grow because of that manufacturing base supporting the economy. So mainly in places like banks, uh, banks uh, and property and some steel. So, so sort of some of these sort of older economy type businesses. Well, that's answered those questions. If we don't read them out, that's, that's why. Uh, let's talk about a topic that's been on everyone's lips this year, and that energy security, uh, really catalyzed by the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. Uh, what are the companies in your portfolio, or perhaps not there, but on your radar, what can they do to, to solve, to go to solve this problem? You talked about uh, the biggest uh, solar panel producer, but uh, what else is in your portfolio that is directly impacting on the energy question? Yeah, I think we've got a pretty broad range actually across the sort of energy portfolio. Um, you know, at one end, we do have some sort of traditional oil and gas companies um, like uh, Jadestone. Uh, this is a company that essentially buys at assets that are not wanted by oil majors anymore, and it gets them at incredibly low prices. You know, often they actually end up getting paid to take assets worth tens or hundreds of millions um, of dollars. Um, so a very efficient um, um, oil producer uh, across parts of parts of Asia. Um, and then we've got a large portion then in the sort of energy transition itself, especially in North Asia. Um, so companies like Korea, we've got Samsung, uh, SDI, which is one of the top five battery makers in the world. Um, and then, as you mentioned, we've got a lot in China. Uh, China clearly wants to be a leader uh, in environmental um, uh, uh, environmental um, companies. Um, uh, and you know, you've got plans already, already uh, this year, you know, EV penetration would be about 25% in the country. So you are far ahead of nearly all other countries. Um, so we've got a, a number of businesses there like um, uh, Wuxi Lead, which is again, makes, makes parts for those, uh, for those batteries. Um, and then the final one I'll mention actually, because it's, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the most obvious, but it's our materials position. Um, you know, it's our, our largest overweight in the portfolio. And that is predominantly focused on copper and nickel. Um, we're actually absolutely crucial for the green transition. Um, you know, copper, the you know, best conductor of electricity in the world. The green transition simply can't happen without copper. Um, we see very strong demand you know, coming at some point over the next five or six years, and just really no supply. There's going to be a huge, huge deficit of copper um, at some point in the next four or five years. Uh, I think that makes you know, copper companies um, very attractive at the moment. Uh, final question from me, and then we'll go on to uh, the viewers' questions. Uh, if you could say... There's one stock in my portfolio that really tells people what Asia is all about. Which, which stock would that be? I mean, the most, the most obvious one to mention there would probably be sort of TSMC. You know, it's, uh, it's arguably the most important company in the world. You know, monopoly in high-end semiconductors, uh, and with semiconductors being the new oil, you know, the world simply couldn't operate without, without TSMC. Um, but you know, try, trying to be less, trying to be less obvious. Um, Maybe highlight too, you, you, you mentioned our Chinese um, energy plays. Um, I think Long Yi is a really interesting business. You know, China has decided it wants to be a leader um, in environmental sectors. Um, it's got the largest captive customer base in the world to do that. Um, and Long Yi has come you know, over the past 10 years to have the, by far the biggest scale in the solar panel uh, business of the world, about 40% market share. Its costs are significantly less uh, than any other player. It's got the best technology. Um, I think that's you know, uh, a business that can really transform um, you know, both energy in China uh, and abroad. And then the second one might be delivery. This is a really transform transformational industry. This is a, it's actually a logistic company, India's largest private pan logistics company, but it's really a play on e-commerce. Um, and this is going to be huge, and it's, it's huge in India. You've got the rise of the consumer, combined with the rise of the internet. It's sort of China 10 or 15 years ago. Um, very hard in India to work out who's going to be the winner at this moment in the e-commerce space. But 
everyone's going to have to use logistics and delivery is by far the best player um, in that space. So a company I think think probably grow you know, 50 or 60 percent per annum um, for quite some time. OK, excellent. Well, we're going to turn to viewers questions. Uh, here's a good one uh, from obviously someone who likes to take a bit of risk in his portfolio or her portfolio. Uh, what do you think of Macau casino stocks at this juncture? Yeah, so have owned them in the past. Um, you used to own Galaxy uh, seven, seven or eight years ago. Um, I'd be quite cautious now. Um, yeah, I certainly think you know, that there's a case that when China opens up and you know, Macau fully opens up, it, it, these stocks could, could do well in the short term. But long term, I think you've got to be very careful in China, particularly at the moment, um, in making sure that you're aligned with policy. Um, and I'm just not convinced the Macau casinos are aligned with Chinese policy. You know, after all, you know, gambling is illegal on the mainland. Um, you know, how much does Xi really want um, you know, a handful of you know, casinos generating billions of dollars um, in profits for, for a handful of um, either rich Chinese tycoons or, in a Chinese sense, worse going overseas to, to, to America. So I'd be, I'd be pretty cautious and you've got the license renewals coming up um, um, fairly soon. So cautious. If I was going to own one, uh, I would go for a local player. Uh, I would go for Galaxy. Um, I, I'd be very cautious of the, uh, you know, the wind, Macau, etc., um, given those US connections and the, and the rising tensions today. Excellent. Uh, another question. Uh, you did talk, obviously, we discussed at length Vietnam. What about other ASEAN countries? Uh, particularly Indonesia. Yes, Indonesia has been the one that we've been we've been adding to uh, over the past uh, past six months. Um, we've had quite large holdings in the um, in the exports of Indonesia, particularly materials, um, uh, copper and nickel, which has really been uh, you know, uh, really been a sort of boom for for Indonesia over the past few years. For the past several years, however, we've been very cautious uh, and remain out of the domestic uh, economy in Indonesia. But I think that side has looked really quite interesting. Um, you know, Indonesia is probably the biggest beneficiary of rising raw material prices. Um, there's a chance it becomes actually a, you know, a hub for electric vehicles in the next five or ten years, given it's the, one of the world's largest suppliers of, 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 of nickel. Um, and that's fantastic for, you know, for supporting a, a domestic growth story. So we've been adding to a couple of the banks, um, Bank Rakyat, for instance, uh, which I think is probably one of the best banks in all of Asia. It's a micro lending business. It was set up in the 1970s to, to, to do micro lending. They built up 18,000 what they call micro desks across the various islands. Um, it's unreplicable today. They've got mini monopolies over the whole country. Um, and as I said, we've got the best competitive advantage of any company in Asia. Um, and also Astra International, we bought, which is the, the leading auto company um, in, in the country. Great growth prospects, 12 times PE on a, on a 4 or 5% dividend yield. Uh, so again, yeah, starting, starting to find quite attractive ideas in Indonesia and uh, one, of our, one of our largest overweight positions. Okay, time for a couple more questions. Uh, one is, uh, you haven't mentioned biotech. Uh, do you have any holdings in biotech? And indeed, is Asia a place where uh, they are innovating in this sector? Yeah, we've got, we've got, we've got, we've got some biotech names. Uh, we've been reducing them uh, over the past 12 months. Um, we previously had a lot in in Korea in the biotech space. Um, you know, many actually perform perform very well, so reduced those on, on valuation grounds. Um, actually, Seoul uh, at one point was the second largest place globally for for, 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 for for clinical trials, massively supported by the government with some you know, excellent university research behind them. Um, so, had been finding interesting ideas there, but as I say, uh, been trimming those uh, recently. Um, so China has been the place where 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 some of the more interesting biotech names um, have been coming from uh, over the past couple of years. Um, I'd say I'm being quite cautious on the healthcare space in China at the moment. It's one of the clear clear areas where the government is going to increase regulation. Um, um, so if you're going to be if you're going to be investing in biotech in in, in China. Got to absolutely make sure that you're in the, the sort of top end, innovative companies that are really doing you know, innovative, exciting things. Because if you're not, uh, your pricing power is just going to disappear over the next you know, couple of years. Um, so yes, there are opportunities, but it's a it's a tougher market uh, given that that regulatory um, oversight. Good. And final question: uh, 
low or no gearing, uh, price is pretty low in the markets out there. Any, are you going to be going to your board to say, I'd like to gear up and uh, take, take advantage of this opportunity? Yes, I'm genuinely getting more, more interested or more, more optimistic on the outlook for Asia, um, you know, particularly given its, uh, its position versus you know, most, most Western developed markets. So I certainly think I certainly think Asia on a three or five year time horizon is very well positioned. Um, currently, uh, don't have any gearing. You know, took it off over the past sort of um, 12, 18 months. Um, we're getting to the stage where certainly thinking about it seriously. Um, uh, haven't pulled the trigger yet, um, but we'll, we'll certainly be considering it. Have to consider which currency carefully. Absolutely. Yeah, there was one more question about, uh, I'm sure, relevant for many uh, viewers today. How does, how does the pound's uh, sudden depreciation affect, uh, affect the value of the trust? I would imagine it would be positive for it. Uh, yeah, it should be broadly positive. Um, yeah, I mean, the... Uh, the, the, the value and the, the assets are, 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 are Asian currencies. Um, um, so yes, uh, that should be broadly positive. And uh, we, can, uh, we can speculate where the pound goes over the next six months. <laughs> <laughs> that would be brave. Uh, Roderick, thank you so much. Uh, and that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. So uh, thank you again, Roderick, for your time and insights. Uh, and thank you to the uh, audience out there for watching and for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't have time for them of all. Uh, we've got more sessions like this coming up, so please do keep an eye out for those if you found today's useful. Uh, and thank you. Goodbye from the CityWire studios.